talk, and if I can just go to a more general kind of understanding um, and uh, ask a, a little bit of a, a question that's maybe out of the framework of um, philosophy of language and um, your particular uh, uh, new um, pioneering work on demarcation and such, and go back a little bit to um, Dewey and um, thinking about um, nonverbal language and as he says um, uh, language widely construed uh, and to me uh, to go beyond demarcation uh, once again speaking generally back to meaning um, and um, thinking about um, that wide area of language wide area of communication that we leave open for ourselves and uh, when we're not formed exactly yet in um, meaning, uh, yet we are using uh, a language that's maybe nonverbal. So, for instance, with the arts and particular artists that have their own iconography, and it often takes years for people to really come on board uh, to the sentient meanings of that iconography. There's uh, works of art that lay dormant uh, for years until they're seen, maybe not with a light going on, uh, but with this form of meaning that you're thinking of as the cultural form. But does it, it also have to do with the nature of, um, uh, of the new language itself? Well, I would claim that the phenomena you're talking about only happen against the background of us being talkers in, in the ordinary sense. Uh, that uh, the languages that you're talking about are not autonomous discursive practices in the sense of being sort of language games one could play though one played no other. They're in principle possible only against the background of us being able to, to do the sort of ordinary talk that we're doing. Uh, I don't think that means that there's no point to talking about uh, languages of art, languages of particular artists, because I think, and this is a, uh, a point I would have claimed to have learned from Hegel, that uh, once we have these autonomous languages as our model, one of the crucial features that would have to be mentioned in responding to the leverage question is uh, discursive norms are uh, distinctive in that uh, it's precisely by binding yourself by these implicit social norms that one, that it becomes possible for one to produce an indefinite number of novel utterances, to, to say things no one's ever said before, and for other people to understand them. And that notion of a system of norms, which by binding yourself by them, uh, repays you in this bonanza of positive expressive freedom, the capacity to uh, perform speech acts in the large sense that couldn't be performed if you hadn't bound yourself by these norms, uh, where that's sort of the point of these communal norms is to produce these uh, free, novel, radically uh, original speech acts. And that that's the feature, above all, of ordinary languages that tempts us when, when we are thinking about art to say, well, this artist is doing that. When, when I learn to see the world the way her paintings are showing it to me, uh, new possibilities open up that weren't opened up before. Uh, that normative constraint is repaid in that sort of, uh, uh, that sort of possibility of originality of novelty. Uh, and I don't pretend to understand that in uh, these cases, but I think that's uh, the feature that tempts us properly to think of them in linguistic terms. Uh, but I do think all of that 
can only happen against the background of us who can talk in, in a much more mundane uh, sense.